Hello and welcome to the inaugural BJUI Key Paper Webinar. My name is Alistair Lamb, BJUI Section Editor for Prostate Cancer, and I'm a clinician scientist here in Oxford at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and the Nuttall Department of Surgical Sciences. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Sigrid Carlson, Associate Editor at BJUI, and an assistant attending, uh, assistant attending epidemiologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Hello, Sigrid. Hello, Alistair. I'm excited for this first webinar. So am I. I'm looking forward to it too. So we, that's Freddie Hamdi and the team at BJUI, have been thinking of new ways to capitalize on our top papers, how to really engage some of the key opinion leaders in the field, how to make the most of our excellent reviewers, and how to communicate good urological science to our readership. And this is what we've come up with. We have two fantastic guests and some time for q and I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom webinars now. Please do ask your questions using the Q&A panel rather than the chat. You're welcome to put stuff on the chat, but it's the Q&A questions that Sigrid and I will be keeping an eye on. And if you see a question you like, then please vote it up. We hope you find this useful. If you do, please let us know. And if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it as well. So, to the paper. This is a paper you actually know quite well, isn't it, Sigrid? I do, I happen to be one of the co-authors. <laughs> Very good. Yes, in this month's BJUI, we have another fine installment from the LAPRO team, with a particular focus on surgeon heterogeneity. The LAPRO trial is a trial that many of us are familiar with from seminal publications in European Urology in 2015 and 2018. It really is a great pleasure to have with us Anders Bartel, the senior author on this paper and one of the key instigators of the LAPRO trial along with Eva Hagland and others. Anders is a professor at Lund University, a consultant at Skarna Hospital in Malmö, and he's also director of the EAU Research Foundation. Anders, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me to be invited to this exciting event. I'm really looking forward to a discussion here tonight. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you. Now, Anders, you have a pretty broad portfolio, as we've just heard. What's the best bit about your job? Mm, well, <clears throat> I'm privileged to focus on one disease that I find very important. That's, of course, prostate cancer. And um, within prostate cancer, such a variety. I mean, one day I do robotic surgery. The next day I do uh, enroll patient in new clinical trials. I see our clinic patients. Um, well, we have new tools to diagnose prostate cancer. We have fusion biopsies, MRI. We have for stadium, PSMA, PET-C. I mean, there's so much you can do about prostate cancer. So uh, working with prostate cancer every day is fascinating. Well, it sounds like you have the perfect job and certainly what you said, you're definitely <laughs> the right person to have here with us this evening. Um, well, we're delighted to have published your LAPRO paper on surgeon heterogeneity in BJY this month. Um, but it'd be great for us to have a bit of background, Anders. Uh, what is it that's unique about the LAPRO trial? Well, um, it's not like many other trials. It's not a, a randomized study, unfortunately. But the setup of study design is quite interesting because we try to give a picture, a broad picture of um, to compare uh, robotic and open prostatectomies if you take into account what happened in different hospitals. Hospitals at a different size. There were seven different hospitals in Sweden where we performed open surgery and seven centers performing robotic surgery. And it was started almost 15 years ago when robotic surgery was new. There was a problem to show superiority compared to open surgery. So um, the study is quite unique because it cover many different hospitals in Sweden. It will give you a picture of 
not only how things are at um, tertiary referral center, but you get a different picture of um, how surgery result, the outcome of surgery can be if you're looking in a different, in a broad perspective. So that's the, a little bit different from many other studies. And is it fair to say that there are some aspects of how the health system and your system works in Sweden, which have particularly lent themselves to this, this study being performed? Yeah, what well, we have uh, one of the centers or two centers that participate with patients uh, were actually private clinics, but uh, most of the centers are uh, public hospitals. University hospitals, small, medium-sized hospitals. Yeah. And I, I think you mentioned to me, Anders, that this paper was actually voted one of the 10 most interesting papers uh, in a publication, I think you said, called Today's Medicine in Sweden. Yeah, actually, it was actually highlighted um, in Sweden, uh, one of the, um, the most interesting paper last year coming from the Swedish research group in clinical research. So that's one thing we were extremely happy about, but of course also to get it published in the BJU International. As you know. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to host it. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna play a, a short video that's been prepared for Anders and his co-authors as an overview of, of the paper. So I'm gonna share that now. Radical prostatectomy, or RP, is a common and effective treatment for patients with prostate cancer. However, several long-term complications, such as erectile dysfunction, or ED, and incontinence are associated with RP. There are two approaches to this operation, the traditional retropubic radical prostatectomy, or RRP, and robot-assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy, or RALP. Surgeon heterogeneity, or variations in procedural outcomes based on individual differences between surgeons, has been suggested to play an important role in determining the rates of long-term complications after RP with the above two techniques. To test this hypothesis, scientists from Sweden utilized a multi-center study approach. They analyzed 4,003 patients enrolled in the laparoscopic prostatectomy robot OPEN, or the LAP-PRO trial, a prospective trial performed to compare outcomes after RRP and RALP. They then collected data via questionnaires given to patients before surgery and at 3, 12, and 24 months post-surgery. Clinical data was collected from hospitals at the same intervals. Surgeons who participated in the study were categorized based on experience. The scientists evaluated urinary incontinence, ED, and recurrence at 24 months after surgery as the study endpoints. They found that among surgeons who performed at least 20 surgeries during the study period, there was a large and statistically significant heterogeneity for incontinence, ED, and rate of recurrent disease. More specifically, differences in the surgeon's prior experience accounted for 42% of the observed heterogeneity in incontinence and 11% in ED, but did not significantly influence surgeon heterogeneity for recurrence. The surgeon's annual volume had the greatest impact on the risk of recurrence and accounted for 19% of the observed surgeon heterogeneity. Moreover, differences in surgeon volume had a significant impact on results when comparing RALP and RRP. It also had a glaring effect on the recurrence rate. The high surgeon heterogeneity with respect to RP functional and oncological outcomes can therefore be partly explained by differences in surgeon experience and annual volume. Reducing surgeon heterogeneity is one of the needs to be prioritized for successful outcomes. So Anders, I'm about to introduce our next guest, who I think I'm right in saying you only actually met for the first time this evening. Uh, John Yaxley is a consultant at the Royal Brisbane Hospital and Wesley Hospital, and is an associate professor at the University of Queensland, Australia. He's also the lead author of the famous Brisbane RCT on 
Open versus Robotic Prostatectomy, which was published in The Lancet, no less, in 2016, at the time of which I was actually doing my fellowship with Declan Murphy at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. And this paper sent shockwaves around the place with headline articles in the national newspaper, The Australian, and it really was a talking point at Tony Costello's annual prostate cancer conference in Melbourne, which I think, John, was the last time that we met. John, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you and welcome to Brisbane, Australia, where it's, it's starting to rise and we're pretty COVID free, so it's a good day. Indeed, very good. So John, you reviewed this paper. Indeed, you undertook a really detailed and wonderfully comprehensive review of the manuscript for which I think I can say on behalf of Freddie and the team at BJUI, we are tremendously grateful. So it seemed fitting to ask John to reflect on the paper, on the findings, to provide some critique and consider the clinical implications. After John speaks, we'll turn to a Q&A session. Please do, as I mentioned, be entering your questions and vote up any questions you'd like Sigrid and I to offer first to the panelists. John, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so look, in, 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 uh, basically with respect to time, I won't spend um, too much time going through this because we want to keep discussions going. But just to update on the actual LAPRO outcomes, there was no difference in continence at two years between robotic and open surgery. There was no difference in recurrence rate, but there was a, a positive outcome in favour of the robotic arm with respect to um, local recurrence in PT3 disease and also with respect to a favourable outcome with respect to rectal function. But in a non-randomised trial, it's very difficult to exclude selection bias and that's one of the, 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 the uh, complications or one of the, the concerns with interpreting this data. Now, with, with the current study we're going to talk about, which is the surgeon heterogeneity, I've always felt if you're going to remove the prostate or any organ with the same technique, then the functional and oncological outcomes you'd expect to be similar, um, whether you did it by an open or a laparoscopic or a robot assisted laparoscopic approach. So I think the strength of our randomized control trial was that it was randomized with two experienced surgeons, experienced their technique and good surgical procedures. Although lapro wasn't randomized, the, the strength of the lapro study was there were a lot of different surgeons with different surgical techniques in a community setting with different caseloads. And the, and the beauty of this study is they then adjusted for the surgeon techniques, not just pathology outcomes, not just patient factors, but also surgeon factors with respect to nurse bearing, surgeon experience and annual caseload. And this trial had the unique opportunity, unlike our trial, of, of really looking at the outcomes of the least experienced surgeons and the most experienced surgeons in the trial. Um, so what I was really interested in is whether this would show, whether uh, uh, this study would show that inexperienced surgeons could master the radical prostatectomy technique uh, and become competent faster than open surgeons. And whilst I'm not sure that the trial actually answered that question, the really interesting point was that if you look at the surgeons with the highest volume, the 12 surgeons with the highest volume, there was still a significant difference in an outcome with respect to incontinence and erectile function. And so it was clear to me that heterogeneity is not just about um, the number of cases you do per year, um, it's also um, relates, I think, especially to previous training, uh, surgical technique and clearly attention to detail. And if you're in a high volume center watching the webinar and you think, well, look, 41 cases as the annual um, uh, caseload is low, that, 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 that's, that's not necessarily true. Although this, uh, this trial had some um, uh, biases, the surgeons, were, the open surgeons were more experienced before the trial started and the robotic surgeons did a higher annual caseload during the trial. 41 cases may seem to, to high volume surgeons, not a lot, but that reflects to the community setting. This is our caseload in Australia. And in Australia, the median um, um, number of robotic prostatectomies performed by surgeon each year is 25, 63 over a three year period. And 40% uh, are performed by surgeons who do more, uh, less than 20 cases a year. So, um, 
the, the trial looked at a lot of different things and it's, and it's really important. Your outcomes can depend on what you're looking at. If you're looking at baseline analysis in the annual caseload, then open surgery appeared to give better continence. But if you then added prior experience in nursing, the, the, the um, statistical significance uh, was not there. And similarly with erectile dysfunction, it's unchanged by annual caseload and nurse bearing, but uh, it, it, it changes if you've got uh, the inclusion of prior surgery experience. So the, the important thing to me was that annual caseload itself did not independently impact the functional outcomes. And that to me stressed the importance of the surgical training we get before we start on our careers. So just really, this was a, a statement in the discussion um, section of the, of, the, of, the, of the manuscript, and it was a really good statement to me. It just really put together the, the important factors, and that is how do we train our urology registrars to become competent robotic surgeons? How do we transition open surgeons to become competent robotic surgeons? And, and, and what are the basic skills required for surgeons to start a solo independent robotic practice? And then what's the annual caseload required? I think training is very important. I know Tony Costello in Melbourne is, is really looking at a training module to help us develop laparoscopic skills. And, and he's, he's a, it's a really good program. And that's the sort of thing we need. And finally, just the final slide is, you know, what specific publicly available data do we provide our patients to let them make an informed decision about their choice of surgeon? And it appears that surgeon is a very important factor in the outcome for a robotic or an open osteotectomy. And just finally, it's not just about surgeon skills, it's about other characteristics of being a surgeon with empathy, good communication skills. We don't cure all the people we operate on. It's about 30% of men will end up with biochemical recurrence after prostate cancer, probably 50% if you're operating on the high risk cohort. And so this is a lifelong relationship and survivorship with our patients and that's very important. So there's some, some simple points that I, uh, that I, um, uh, I thought I came through when I looked at this uh, talk. Uh, thank you so much. So, so Sigrid and I are going to, we've been having a look at the questions, but I wonder while we just kind of consider those a bit more and, and, and perhaps wait for a few more to come in. Um, it occurred to me, uh, John, seeing as this is the first time you, you, you and Anders have met, would you like to put some of those questions you had in your final slide to Anders? Yeah, I think it'd be great. I mean, to, to me, what do you think are the most important things about trying to, 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 to decrease or squash that um, surge in heterogeneity? I, I mean, um, in my opinion, this study is a little bit an eye opener for us to where we really describe the differences. And we also identify differences between experienced surgeons. So I think that is also important to, as you mentioned, um, what is the annual caseload you should have to perform your skills? And even if you're an experienced surgeon, you may be not the best surgeon. You may not be um, as careful as you should be. So I think that is um, the training of the new surgeons is to train them step by step before they can perform the whole procedure to the training program is important and also how to maintain your skills. So there are two, two uh, very important things here. And I, I guess this is quite obvious for everyone, but it cannot be <laughs> mentioned too many times. Thank you so much. Now, Sigrid, um, I wonder if you've selected uh, the, the most helpful, perhaps most voted for question that we might turn to first. Yeah, so um, on that question of, of training, Anders, uh, we have a question here from uh, Dr. Declan Murphy, who's asking, um, <laughs> there was a mixture of uh, public and private centers in LAPRO, and yeah. presumably the trainees get their training at the public centers. I don't know if that's true, but you can tell us. Um, so he's asking, is there a confounder in interpreting the surgeon heterogeneity? as the different trainees may have been doing significant steps under the name of a particular surgeon in public centers? Well, um, the distribution between public and private centers is not equal. There were one, uh, only two uh, private centers performing this. And at both centers, the surgeon was quite experienced. So, and that was not the case at the public hospitals. 
So <laughs> to compare public and private hospitals in a leper study is quite difficult because there are they are not equal. So, but of course, training training is um, carried out at the public hospitals and not really at the private centers. So, um, sorry, Sigrid. Yeah. If I, if I may, we 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 have uh, two questions from the editor in chief, Freddie Hamdi. I think, as the editor in chief, we'll allow him to. Um, and he says, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Two questions. What do you think is the impact of surgery and heterogeneity on the conduct of RCTs? How should we mitigate for this variable, Anders? And you analyzed surgeon heterogeneity. What about patient heterogeneity, case selection and fundamental differences in pathology requiring variable interventions? Well, um, <laughs> thank you, Freddie. Two very important question. Um, I also would like to congratulate John and the team for performing the, the famous Brisbane study. That's really fantastic. And that's the best study you can do if you want to compare different do two different methods like open and robotic surgery. That's the way to mitigate all the um, um, possibilities for error there to, to have one very experienced surgeon and at, in each of the two arms. So I think that's the, the way, but also when you, when you perform um, a randomized clinical trial that you did to, to um, adjust for as many factors as possible that you believe may influence the results, the outcome. So, and that's also what we've done in the leper study in the different papers we published. We try, and then we try to, every time we have longer follow up to report, then we try to adjust for the same confounding factors every time. Uh, I think that's also important. So, and there are many things that can influence the, the outcome. So, adjustments, very important, and of course, to, um, Randomized clinical trials, that's the best way you can do it to compare to two different methods. Thanks, Anders. John, did you have, have something you wanted to mention on that? Yeah, I, I just think that, um, I mean, a randomized trial is the ultimate thing you need to do. I totally agree with um, with Freddie Hamdi on that. And we we thought of having a multi-surgeon, multi-center um, trial when we did the Brisbane, before we, before we started that, but it just would have biased against robotic surgery. We're in a learning curve. And as I said before, that it's easier to randomize into a study when the technology, whatever it is, when the technology is new and it's not publicly available to the general community and there's already not a bias to the general community that that's the best treatment because then it would be hard to randomise. But, um, but then you need to make sure you've got a, a, an experienced and a, and a technically competent and also a really well trained technical surgeon. And that's what we had with our robotic surgeon who did you know, a two year fellowship in an incredibly high volume unit um, with, um, with people telling the states. And, and I was the most experienced surgeon at Royal Brisbane so I did the opener. Excellent, thanks John, a great additional comment. Uh, Sigrid, what have you chosen for us next? Well, I'm, I'm listening to this interesting uh, discussion because, you know, we have the world experts here in the uh, RCTs of, of, uh, of surgical uh, techniques. Uh, I'm curious, you know, in terms of going forward, you know, given this study where we show this massive heterogeneity, even among, you know, experienced surgeons, in terms of study design and not just in neurology, but, you know, the, the PI of LAPRO, Eva Hoglind, who's also on the call, she's a colorectal surgeon. I mean, is it so that we cannot do randomized controlled trials in, you know, evaluating surgical techniques because of this heterogeneity? Or is the answer then to do what you did in, in Australia with a single surgeon uh, design? What do you think? I don't think it needs to be a single surgeon design. I mean, ultimately, the, the ultimate trial is a multi-center, multi-surgeon trial, but you just need to make sure that um, the surgeons you use in those centers are well-trained at their technique. They're the best at their technique. Um, for instance, uh, in a, a laparoscopic versus uh, robotic-assisted laparoscopic trial, it'd be great for 
the surgeons most experienced in their technique to do all the lap and the most experienced in their technique to do all the robot rather than surgeons who do both participate in the trial. So that might be a criticism there. But so providing you've got the surgeons and you know they've been trained well and, that, and their outcomes are good, that's when you can compare the technologies rather than comparing the surgeons. And the randomization will hopefully take out some of the heterogeneity in both patient factors and surgeon factors. I mean, I'm thinking of that expression, you know, it's it's not the tool, but it's who's using the tool or as Peter Carroll sometimes says, it's not the it's not the, uh, the song, but it's the, the singer. So um, it, it's interesting when you do studies comparing techniques when you have this variability uh, among the surgeons. Great. I'm going to take a question from Hide Yamamoto, if that's okay, from Maidstone. He's a co-investigator on our Translate trial. Um, transrexal versus LATP prostate biopsies. Um, just to plug there. So Hide asks, patients want to be operated on by a surgeon with good outcomes. Why focus on surrogate markers such as surgeon volume or experience, which only explain part of the outcome? Why not publish independently collected and statistically adjusted and individual surgeon outcomes data so that patients can decide for themselves? Anders, can I put that to you first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, different countries are different in Sweden. The patients are not really supposed to ask about the surgeons. Sometimes they are happy and they believe that they will always get a, a very good surgeon. That's the way it is in Sweden in most cases. Of course, we have some private hospitals where you can pick, select the surgeon you would like to be operated on by. But uh, so that's the case. But I mean, um, uh, I think, think things will change. People will be, patients will be more and more aware of um, that there are differences in performance between surgeons. And I think in the future, they will be more uh, interested in, in um, getting the best surgeon. So um, I think it do you will agree with you, in the future. John, what do you think? Hey, that's difficult. Um, so look, I, I, I'm very proud of the Australian healthcare. We've got great urologists in, in Australia, all of them, they're, they're wonderful, but there's obviously some, some heterogeneity differences. The trouble about the information to give patients, it's important to give patients information. They want to pick their decision. They obviously, everyone wants to get the best outcome. But if you just look at that T3, uh, PT3 difference, um, if you're going to publish that data, then surgeons PT3 uh, and positive margin rate can be uh, operating on a, a, a clinical T1C, four plus three, and he's got a bit of focal extra capsule extension, and he's going to have a low um, positive margin rate, whereas if you're a surgeon that operates on bulky palpable disease four plus five, you're clearly going to have extra capsule extension, which is PT3, mm -hmm. but you're going to have a much higher positive surgical margin rate than the other surgeon. So if one surgeon sends that group of patients for radiotherapy, but just operates and, and publishes his PT3 data on, on, those, uh, on those cases where they're most likely to be negative, he's going to look like a better surgeon, but that doesn't make him a better oncological surgeon at all. So it's how you interpret what's um, clinically available to the community that's important. And, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but the community is certainly going to want more. So we're going to try and get through three questions in our final three minutes um, uh, from uh, Paul Cathcart, uh, Catherine Lovegrove and Alan McNeil. Um, although, have you just answered Paul Cathcart's question, Sigrid? I think you might have done. Um, so let me turn to Catherine Lovegrove's question. Um, as trainers, will this publication affect how you train your residents and registrars? And if so, then how? Catherine Lovegrove is a, a trainee of ours in Oxford, and it's a good question. Um, Anders, if I could go to you first again. Um, well, we have this uh, double console uh, equipment now, so we can, uh, one experience and one <laughs> surgeon, one beginner, sit on the opposite side of the console and uh, teach step by step how to perform the procedure. So, as I mentioned before, in training, you start first with uh, the less advanced part of the procedure and then when you have shown that you have uh, you do that very good very well and then you go to the next step of the procedure and then it will may take a long time until you you can perform the whole procedure but uh, i think it that's a safe way to train our young surgeons great um john if we don't if, i'm so sorry to cut you off there i might just 
let Sigrid put the next one from Paul Cathcart. Yes, so on that note, uh, Paul Cathcart is asking, is there a plan to identify the best surgeons of each technique and then try and distill how they get the best outcomes technique-wise to allow the development of an advanced training module to improve outcomes across the board? Do you have any such plans, Anders? Well, I think John explained that in a very nice way. I mean, what is the best surgeon? I mean, you need to look at functional outcomes, you need to look at oncological outcomes. And uh, I mean, um, so I think the definition of the best surgeon is quite difficult. But experience is, as we've shown, experience is important and annual volume is important. So, I mean, you can report your experience, you can report your annual volume, your functional and uh, oncological outcome. And, but then, of course, it's influenced if you are the only surgeon at your center performing all the difficult cases, then the results will be different from maybe an, a, another surgeon. Yeah, I think training is training is the essence, particularly at the start of your career. I obviously feel the fellowship training is, is the appropriate way to go. Um, and then it's all about the technique. And the, the value now is with webinars and with, with the internet, there's, you can review other people's work. We, we have two robot theatres side by side, and I'm quite often going into the theatre next door and having a chat to the surgeon. And there's peer review going on there. They watch you operate, you watch them operate. Um, and so I think for our trainees, it's going to be better than the old days of open surgery where you're fighting with clashing of heads to actually see into the pelvis. So hopefully that will make a difference. So I think we're going to have to draw stumps there, I'm afraid. We promised we'd stick to half an hour or just over. A huge thank you to our guests and panellists, Anders Bartel and John Yaxley. Uh, thank you to my co-host, Sigrid Carlson. Thank you to all uh, 57 of you or so who've joined us live just now. We're going to make the recording of this webinar almost immediately available on YouTube um, with extracts circulated on Twitter. Please do share and comment uh, using the hashtag LaproSurgeon and tag at BJUI Journal. Ask any of the questions that weren't answered and apologies to those who asked questions that we didn't answer. Uh, the authors and the editorial team will keep a close eye on these to offer thoughts, answers and opinions. Until the next time, that's it from BJO Webcasts. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>